Well, next Monday will mark 100 days since Tony Abbott and the coalition came to power. To mark the occasion, the Prime Minister has given a round of newspaper interviews indicating his priorities for the year ahead and conceding some of the mistakes he's made in office. But as the milestone approaches, voters don't appear to be impressed with the new administration. Opinion polls show Labor's now the preferred party for government. If an election were held tomorrow, the coalition would be turfed out. A government that says what it means and means what it says a government of no surprises and no excuses, a government that understands the limits of power as well as its potential. Well, for more on Tony Abbott's first 100 days, our political correspondent Andrew Green is speaking to the Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister, Josh Frydenberg, who's in Melbourne. Josh Frydenberg, welcome to Weekend Breakfast. Uh, good morning, Andrew. Nice to be with you. As we've just heard, uh, the Prime Minister was uh, on election night promising a government with no excuses and no uh, surprises, but we have seen uh, a broken promise initially with Gonski. We saw uh, some shock at the announcement with the blocking of the Grain Corp takeover and a few other uh, missteps, say, on the Indonesia crisis. Can you understand that some voters may be a little bit unsettled, what they've seen over the first 100 days? Well, Andrew, no surprise to you that I disagree with your, the premise of your question. In terms of Gonski, there was no broken promise. In fact, there's an extra $1.2 billion that will go to Western Australia, to Queensland and the Northern Territory that wouldn't have flowed under Labor. In, in terms of the Grain Corps deal, that was a very difficult decision for the Treasurer, but he had to take into account the fact uh, that the impact on competition, because Grain Corps was a monopoly, uh, effectively controlling about 85 per cent of the eastern seaboard's uh, bulk grain exports. Uh, I think you know the Prime Minister has started very well. Uh, we've had a number of successes on the border protection issue. Um, numbers are down in terms of unauthorised arrivals by around 80 per cent. Um, we are going to be releasing uh, my EFO next Tuesday, which will effectively air the dirty linen of the Labor Party when it comes to the budget, and we're trying to clean up that mess. Uh, and we've announced a number of measures there in terms of deregulatory measures. Uh, and in, in terms of the carbon tax and the mining tax, um, we have passed the legislation through the lower house. Uh, obviously, it's going to have some difficulty in the current Senate, but after July, I think that will change. Um, in terms of the tone of the debate, Andrew, I think the Prime Minister has changed the tone of the debate and is not running around doing an interview every minute of every day, which what is what we saw from his Labor predecessors. When he goes out and does media, it's because he has something to say, and that has changed the tenor and, and the nature of the public debate. If that's the, uh, the case and uh, you, you believe that there have been already some successes, though we're yet to see the repeal of those uh, pieces of legislation, carbon and mining, why do you think the honeymoon has been so short-lived? Look, I think it's, it has been a difficult period because there has been a number of issues that we're dealing with that are legacies of the previous government, and you referred to the Indonesia issue. I mean, there were allegations that go back um, to 2009. Um, and in terms of just the, the, the general challenges that we do face, um, but I'm you know, not reading too much into these polls, Andrew, at all. It's just a few weeks in. Uh, if we have polls like this in a couple of years' time, I suppose the, the response would be different. But uh, we've got three years of our term. We've got a big agenda. We're going to have to take some very hard decisions. We're going to stick to our commitments, and we're going to try to clean up the mess that was left to us. In the round of interviews that the Prime Minister's given to newspapers today, he said that it's not an unreasonable request of Qantas to expect uh, the uh, restrictions on its ownership to be lifted. Are you happy perhaps to see another Australian key company move into foreign control? Well, look, uh, there's a lot of water to flow under the bridge in, in relation to that. Um, the Prime Minister and the Treasurer have both said, Andrew, they're prepared to have a conversation with the Australian people uh, about this issue. Uh, you know, Qantas doesn't operate on a level playing field. As you know, uh, major sta stakeholders in Virgin include Air New Zealand, um, include Etihad, uh, and include Singapore Airlines, all of which have um, some form of state ownership. Um, so it's a difficult issue and a difficult climate for Qantas, but we're prepared to consider 
um, their submissions, uh, prepared to have a conversation with the Australian people on this issue, and ultimately, if there was any change to uh, the foreign ownership restrictions, that would be a matter for the federal parliament. And you wouldn't feel uncomfortable if uh, other countries had a control in our national carrier? Look, I don't think we're at that point yet, uh, and I wouldn't want to preempt any outcomes in, in relation to those discussions. I mean, Qantas is an iconic Australian brand. It's uh, the spirit of Australia. It's nearly 100 years old, and it's got more than 30,000 employees. So my first priority for Qantas, the government's first priority for Qantas, is to ensure that it survives, that it prospers, continues to employ Australians and continues to do what it's done for nearly 100 years and that's to serve the Australian public. You mentioned MyEVO, it's out on Tuesday. MPs are being told to expect a horrific uh, uh, result when that's released. Do you believe um, if there is a budget emergency we should start seeing the cuts before uh, the budget rather than wait till May? Well look, we've got $20 billion of savings, Andrew, that is currently being blocked by the Labor Party and that includes $5 billion of savings that they announced when they were last in government that they're now blocking us from implementing. Uh, some tough decisions will need to be made because Australia has a ballooning budget deficit and ballooning uh, debt issue. I mean, we're nearly at $300 billion worth of debt and uh, it's climbing given the challenges in the global and Australian economies. Um, that means for the Australian taxpayer there's an interest bill of around $10 billion a year, a year. Now that is equivalent, Andrew, to about 10 new teaching hospitals being built around Australia every single year just from the interest payments on that debt. So, so what areas we need should to get be it quarantined from spending cuts? Well, look, the Prime Minister, when he was the leader of the opposition, talked about defence and talked about medical research as being two areas um, that he uh, wanted to be quarantined. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, we've got to get the budget back into surplus. I hope those areas uh, are not touched. Um, but uh, we have got some difficult decisions to make. Now, on defence, you have had a long-term interest in that field. There are some uh, reports through Freedom of Information that uh, the Defence Force Chief may have misled Parliament over the death of an Afghan prisoner uh, a couple of years ago in October 2010. Are you confident uh, that, that this case uh, doesn't need to be looked at again? I'm very confident that the Minister of Defence and the Chief of the Defence Force will handle that issue entirely appropriately and, and properly. I'm sure if there are more is if there is more to say on that issue, they will, Andrew. But uh, you know, I have great confidence in our Australian Defence Force. Um, they served the country very well in Afghanistan. That was a difficult conflict, um, but they did make a real difference on the ground. I went there in 2011 and I saw the girls' school that they built, um, and I saw the uh, the roads that they helped build, and uh, and other infrastructure. And working side by side with our aid program, uh, we really made a big difference in Afghanistan and continue to do so. Finally, Josh Frydenberg, uh, Frydenberg you are the uh, parliamentary secretary to the Prime Minister. His chief of staff has copped a lot of criticism from your fellow MPs in the coalition. Do you think those attacks are fair? Does Peter Credlin have too much control or is there a distinct uh, flavour of sexism in those attacks? Well, firstly, uh, I think a lot of the attacks have come from the other side of politics because they know... Well, no, they've if... come from people like uh, senators and uh, other members who've backgrounded against it. Oh, look, there was one uh, Queensland senator, you're right, who, who made some criticisms, but uh, I think uh, there is very strong and widespread support for Peter Credlin. Uh, she does an outstanding job. Those attacks are unfair. She's not behaving, Andrew, in any way that's different to, you know, Labor chiefs of staff to, to various prime ministers, whether it was Dennis Richardson under Bob Hawke uh, or others, uh, or indeed uh, Graham Morris and Arthur Sinodinus under John Howard. Um, chiefs of staff have a very difficult job because what they have to do is be the eyes and ears of the Prime Minister. They speak with the authority of the Prime Minister. They've got to interact with colleagues, with stakeholders, keep a watch on what's happening with Parliament. Um, and, you know, they have a very, very big job. And uh, Peter Credlin deserves an enormous amount of credit. So do her other colleagues in the Prime Minister's office for the work they did with the uh, then Leader of the Opposition, Tony Abbott, to help um, get ourselves into, into government. Um, she continues to have the, uh, the support uh, of the entire coalition team and, of course, from the Prime Minister. So, you know, I think those are unfair allegations or criticisms and I think she's around for a long time to come and she does an outstanding job.
Josh Frydenberg, as we approach Monday in the first 100 days, thank you very much for joining us on Weekend Breakfast. Nice to be with you, Andrew. Thanks for the invitation.